started. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so I kind of thought about this a little bit. Um, see, I, you know, I, I do exactly the same thing that I said I recommend people to do. I put things in my back burner, you know, the slow cooker, just let it stew, and then, you know, after a while I get an idea like, okay, you know, this is the way to do it. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to explain today how to call subroutines and how to return from subroutines. But since we haven't really talked about the I386 or the um, uh, 686, the 64-bit instruction set, it's kind of harder to do it that way compared to using our own processor, the toy processor. So I'm going to explain how to call a subroutine from the perspective of a toy processor, from our toy processor and also how to return from a subroutine. So those are the things that we'll go over today. So the instructions should be fairly familiar to you here today. And um, if I have enough time, including the lab time, I can assemble the program by hand. Okay, another chance for you guys to kind of visualize how that is done. <coughs> um, and I can borrow some of your uh, assembler. Okay, I know, you know at least two of you wrote an assembler for that particular processor. You still working on it? Okay, oh, but one and a half then. <laughs> you, yours is you know kind of seventy five five percent done ish. Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Okay. <laughs> but I'm just talking about the assembler, not the. Uh, uh, it's all wrapped up, wrapped up in one big program. Okay. <clears throat> so that's you know, but but it's good. Okay, it's it's commendable of uh, uh, effort. And then somebody else will finish it already, uh, even though the syntax is not quite uh, as flexible as it should be. <laughs> but it's good enough. It's good enough, OK? Um, so anyway, that's what we are going to do today. So that means you know, we need to bring up the simulator, because you know, we, I would like to be able to run it in the simulator. But before we even do that, um, the best thing or the most important part is to think about, okay, what do we need to do when we call a subroutine and what do we need to do when we return from a subroutine, okay? So most of the time, I'm just going to give you a very simple <clears throat> program to look at, you know, just so that we, we can focus on this particular program that is written in C and most of you should know, you know, how it works already, okay? So this is a subroutine that doesn't do a single thing, okay, because I don't want to talk about you know, what to do inside a subroutine. So the only thing the subroutine, this subroutine does is to return. And this is our usual main subroutine. And the only thing it's going to do is to call F. And main has its own return statement, which we are not going to talk about. Okay? So the focus here is this particular thing and this particular thing. Okay? What do we do when we call a subroutine, which is on this line? And what do we do when we return from a subroutine? Yep. So there's an implicit jump to the starting point of the subroutine that you yeah. call it. Okay, so that part is definitely there. Okay, but the trick about the subroutine is that you cannot do it with a simple jump. If you do it with a simple jump, what do we do when we do the return? How do we get back into here? How do we get back to the return zero line of main if you are just jumping into the label F? That's the problem. Okay, the problem is how do we return? Now this problem is not unique to this class, so we are not the only the first people to have to deal with this problem. Okay, so this problem was dealt with in Fortran in a very interesting way. Okay, so in Fortran, what happens is for each subroutine definition. Okay, so in this case, the F is one single definition of a subroutine. It has its own reserved space for returning to whoever is calling it. So when you call the function f, you first store the return address to that static location associated with subroutine f. Then you jump into the subroutine f, and the subroutine f at the end will go to that return address location, which is static. And then look it up and say, OK, I need to go back to that location in main and continue execution in main. Now that works really well unless you have a few types of you know, programming. One is recursion. Now with recursion, you, your, your, where you return to can be yourself, can be somebody else, and it has to stack. Okay? Now the normal way of doing recursion, or the normal example of recursion, 
is easy to deal with. Okay, when you look at recursion like factorial, okay, factorial, <coughs> it is really easy to deal with because in a normal factorial implementation, we say if n equals to zero, then now I'm I'm going to shorthand this here just because this is not the point. Okay, so the point that I want to make is not the proper formatting of the subroutine. So in this case, I am going to use um, a slightly messy way of doing it, okay? Which is returning from inside a conditional statement, which I think is a big no-no, okay? But I think Professor Fox does it all the time. How about Iraja subsidiary? Does he do it too sometimes? Putting a return in the middle of a conditional statement, not all the way to the end. I mean, has anyone far, taken a class from Sam, Mirage? Sam's far doesn't, well, that is the code that he writes, like, has stuff like that, but Java really doesn't. Well, anything. he can't do it. Technically, I mean, he, he can't do, can do it in Java, but, like. Why would you? I mean, you could just yeah, say yeah, it as a return yeah, statement Java's like, like, the top. I, like, I personally would only do a return at the very yeah. end of a subroutine. There's only one single return at the end of a subroutine. He does. Yeah. Anto, Anto's like murder you if you like drug that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, okay, but for this class, you know, for, for this particular class, it is okay because you know. Um, but the point is, we only have one single point of recursion here. Okay. So when it returns, it's always returning to. Oh, let's finish up the multiplication and then we can do the other return. So when you look at the activity of this one, it's not that big of a deal. Now when you look at Fibonacci numbers, it's a little bit different. Okay? So let's go ahead and write the you know, Fibonacci number, Fib and Okay, so with Fibonacci, it is if n equals to zero or n equals to one, okay, I'm gonna <clears throat> do the proper syntax here. So these two would just return n, which is not a problem. Okay, that's the easy one. Return n. And then the else part is the difficult part because there are two points of recursion. Because the first one is fib n minus 1, and then you have to add to fib n minus 2. So now that you have two places where you can call the subroutine, then if you store and it is recursive, if you store the return address at a very stacked place, the second call or the second recursive call is going to mess up the return address, and there's no way to figure out how to return at that point. So the bottom line is you cannot store the return address of a C subroutine at a static place because of you know the possibility of recursion. Now, but recursion is not the only reason why you cannot do, use a static location. Because if recursion is the only reason, then you can just say, well, don't write anything that's recursive which is entirely possible, okay? Anything that can be expressed recursively can also be done without recursion, okay? That's, the equivalency is there, okay? Anything that is iterative can always be done recursively. Anything that is recursive can be done without recursion using just regular loops. And you might have to maintain your own stack to keep track of you know, the actual level of quote unquote recursion, but you can do it without actual recursion with a subroutine. But the problem with um, a static return location has to do with reentrancy. Okay, that's a concept that we probably do not have to deal with in this class, at least not much. But reentrancy has to do with multi-threading for one thing. Okay, because you know, when you have multiple threads, then each thread may potentially call the same subroutine. Okay, and they share you know um, certain aspects. They don't share stack space but they do, they do share static space. So if you have multiple threads in the same program and you have global variables, all the threads will access the very same global variables, which is a good thing and a bad thing sometimes, okay? Because now your threads can interact with each other in very interesting ways because the threads do not give up control and resume the execution on their own, okay? The kernel is responsible. So that means, you know, with any particular thread, it can get its control taken away and have another thread to continue execution and you have no control over that. Unless you're working with Windows 3.1 all the way up to Windows ME, then you might have some little control over that. Is that okay so far? No, sort of. <laughs> okay, but there is a necessity not to store the return address at a static place, okay? And the best way to store the return address is on the stack, 
because the way you call and return is on a last in first out fashion. So the stack becomes really useful for storing and retrieving the return address. Are we doing okay so far with that? Okay. <clears throat> so getting back to I'm going to get rid of these two because they are really just examples of you know how we how people usually use recursion you know as an example but they, they are not really the best examples of recursion. Okay, so getting back to this little example here, the question is what do we do when we call a subroutine and what do we do when we return from a subroutine? When we call a subroutine, there are two things to do. Okay, regardless of the actual implementation, the architecture, there are always two things to do. The first thing to do, okay, one, is to save the return address, which is the what, where to resume after the subroutine is done. So in this particular, was it me or? No. Okay. So, with, uh, so the first thing is you have to save the return address. The return address is what to, where to continue execution. In this case, it's going to be the location of the return zero statement. Okay, because you don't want to return back to that, you know, open and close parent, otherwise you'll keep doing the same thing over and over again. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the easier one, you know, that's the intuitive one, is to continue execution at the called subroutine. There we go. Yep. Just for giggles, mm -hmm. let's say you had a variable at and uh, uh, initialize it before you call f and then you pass x to f. As a parameter? As a parameter. Okay, let's not deal with parameters first. Okay, so we're gonna just deal with the stack or just calling and returning. So there's nothing, no information passed from the caller to the callee. We are just saying, okay, continue execution over there. When you're done, come back to me. So we just want it to be a boomerang. Okay, with no payload. Okay, so what do we do when we return that? So when we return, what we need to do is to first retrieve the return address, which is placed there by the caller, right? And then the second thing we need to do, okay, I'm gonna use the same notation here. Then the second thing we have to do is to continue execution at the retrieved address, okay. So is, is that okay? I mean, just kind of spelling out what to do when you are calling a subroutine, what to do when you return from a subroutine. So once again, this is not uh, specific to C programs. It is it's not specific to assembly language programs. Just about any modern day programming language would do exactly that, okay? The only programming language that I know of that do not do something like this is Fortran and the early day basic in um, you know, AppleSoft Basic, for instance, doesn't do this. I believe some of the earlier day Microsoft Basic also does not do this. But every single modern programming language would do this. Okay, Are we doing okay so far with this concept here? Saving the return address, continue execution. When you're done with the subroutine, you retrieve the return address and then continue execution at the, ret at the retrieved address. Is that okay? All right, so let's go throw something else into here. So we're going to say save the return address, but where are we going to save it? On the stack, okay? Where do we retrieve the return address? From the stack, okay? So I'm just adding one little thing to it, but this is really important because the stack is last in first out, which is exactly how we want to be able to call and return from subroutines. The last subroutine that you call is the first one to return. Okay, is that okay? All right. <clears throat> okay, so that means we have to be able to manipulate the stack, being able to save something on the stack, and being able to retrieve something from the stack. The other part is easy, okay? This part is really easy. Uh, once we know the address of the subroutine, even with our toy architecture, we can do, just do an LDIA with the target address, and then do a jump A, okay? To return is also easy. Once we retrieve the return address into a register, let's say register A, we just need to say a JMP A in order to continue execution at the retrieved address. So th that part is easy. Now how do we maintain the stack? 
Now, the stack, if you have taken CISP 430, the stack is an abstract concept. In other words, it is just a way to store something and to retrieve something. But the, the internal mechanism is usually kind of like, OK, we'll implement it this way or another way, and so on. You can use a linked list for that purpose. You can use an array for that purpose. There are many ways to do it. In assembly language programming, we don't have abstraction. Okay, We have memory locations. We got registers. We got opcode or instructions. That's all we got. So we have to create the illusion of a stack using those items. Is that okay? Sort of. Okay. So what we'll do is we are going to take a look at this code here, okay, in C, and then we say, okay, but how do we implement the stack? And once we know how to how we implement the stack, how do we utilize the stack and do all of these things? So that would be the target of today's lecture. And we might spill over to the lab, you know, just so that you know, I can assemble the program and actually run it to illustrate you know, how it is done in actual uh, programs. Okay? Is that okay? So this is the target. So the first thing we need to do is to say, okay, but how do we implement a stack? To implement a stack, the most basic concept is a stack pointer. So I'm going to kind of roll this off the screen first because you know, this is kind of like a new topic. We'll get back to that subroutine. <clears throat> so we need a stack pointer. And the, the definition of a stack pointer is it points to the last thing we saved on the stack. Is that okay? And because of the last in first out nature, the stack pointer has to be adjusted accordingly. Okay? The second thing we also want to know is, okay, but where is the starting point of the stack? And how does it grow and how does it shrink? Okay? So we basically say a stack grows down. Okay? Which means that as we push, which is another fancy word for saving, okay, as we save more items on the stack, the stack pointer goes lower. There we go. Is that part okay? Yep. So then the thing on top mm -hmm. of the stack is actually on bottom of the stack. That is correct. The last thing that you push on the stack has the lowest address on the stack. Okay? So it's kind of counterintuitive, but it actually makes a lot of sense in some other way. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at why it makes sense. Okay? All right. <clears throat> is this part okay? So um, I can use a C pro program as an example. So let's say you know, I have a stack of integers. So we'll just you know, force it to have you know, a particular number of integers. Okay? So in order to uh, simulate the stack operation, I'm going to have a pointer to an integer. We'll just call this you know, stack pointer, SP, okay? which is a very conventional name for a stack pointer. So in the code here, stack pointer initially is pointing to the last thing that we push on the stack. But with an empty stack, where is it? So let me, let me give you a picture. It's, it's, it's the highest it's, value. Well, OK, so this is the actual chunk of space that I reserve as a stack, S-P-A-C-K. It has got 256 integers. Okay. Initially, the stack is empty. There's no item in it. But the stack pointer, quote unquote, is supposed to point to the last thing that we push on the stack. So there's nothing in the stack, so there's. It has to point stack here. The has to point to something before the stack begins. It, it's past the last element. Okay, so that's where we mm -hmm. initialize the stack pointer. So the stack pointer is actually initialized. Well, okay, choose, take your poison, choose your poison. You can specify it like this, okay, which is one way to specify um, the the address past the entire stack. In this case, the stack is just an array. Or if you choose, you can also use the other way. You know, I'm going to um, I, need a, I need a way to represent the alternatives. So you can either do it this way, or you can choose to do it like this. It's the address of stack 256, which is the element that does not exist. It is past the last one. Will cause a segmentation point? No, it won't, because you are just initializing a pointer. You can make a pointer point anywhere. That's true. As long as you don't de-reference it, uh -huh. it will still be okay. Okay. 
So that's the thing. So when you push, okay, so let's see what a push operation would be, would look like, okay? So to push something on the stack, in this case, I can only push integers on the stack. The first thing we need to do when we push or when we save something on the stack is first to reserve, okay, reserve space on the stack for the new item, okay? Uh, now, how do we do that when we have a stack pointer? That is supposed to be according to the last thing that we push on the stack. Just make it point lower. Mm -hmm. so Does that make any sense? Yep. So we first do a minus minus SP. That's the first item to do. And then the second thing we do is once we do the minus minus SP, what it points to now is actually the space that I want to put the new item, right? So I can now say, you know, dereference SP, and we just say, okay, push. I'm going to say push X here. X is the value that we are saving on the stack. <coughs> So now we can say star sp equals to x, and that's how we push an integer x on a stack of integers. <laughs> Is that okay? All right, so two operations. And how do we pop x? Now, to pop x means you know, we are going to retrieve, retrieve whatever is last pushed into x. Yep, go ahead. X equals uh, star SP semicolon SP plus plus semicolon. Exactly. So the, op so, so the operation is entirely opposite to the other one. Now, when I say opposite, I'm not only referring to the minus minus becomes a plus plus. I'm not only referring to the direction of the assignment operation. I'm also referring to the order of how we adjust the stack pointer first, and then we access memory when we're pushing, and how we adjust the stack pointer first, excuse me, how we retrieve from memory, and then we adjust the stack pointer as when we pop. So they're opposite in every single way. But the ordering is important. Okay, you have to first reserve the space, and then you put something into the space that you have reserved. And when you're retrieving, you have to retrieve first, and then you deallocate that space. Why do we want to follow this particular order? Why do you think the order is important? Whether we save the space first, and then we allocate, and we, we restore. Why, why, why can't we reverse the order? Because then you'll be putting it overriding the old one. Possibly, but, but you can always say, you know, SP minus one, the reference SP minus one, and then you, you do the actual subtraction. It is not optimal, obviously, you're doing something twice because you're subtracting twice, but why else would that be a problem? It has to be, go ahead. Because what if you get to a value at the very, very bottom of the stack where there is no SP minus one? Well, it would still be equivalent in terms of the operation. The biggest problem has to do with interrupts, okay, which is a concept that we haven't really talked about. An interrupt is kind of like a hardware call, okay? Um, I'm not gonna talk about that concept just yet, okay? So when we have enough time, you know, we'll talk about interrupts. But today's topic is really just subroutines. I'm just going to say that the ordering is important. Okay, you have to reserve the space, and then you use the space that you have reserved. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Um, I can give you a scenario where this can be kind of like if you can, if you cannot remember anything about the actual concept, remember this. Okay. So back in the uh, the gold rush era. Okay. So let's just say that you you look at a piece of dirt and go like, I think that's gold here. Okay. All right. So the, the the convention during that time is you have to you have to claim your staking. You know, you actually have to put in the stakes to mark that spot and say it is mine. Okay, before you start digging. Okay, because if you don't put the stakes down, it's everybody's. You know, you know, every, everybody can get to it. So let's say you found your you know, your your spot when you think that's good, and you don't bother to reserve that first. You don't bother to put your stakes down. Okay, and go to the local you know, office of the government of if there is any type of government or any control at that point, you go there and go like, okay, this is my spot, you know, and then you go back and dig, okay? If you don't do that, you start digging right away, and the next person comes around and go like, I like that spot too. <laughs> then what, what's gonna happen? You can have a fight, you can have overriding, okay? Now, if you're, if you're both there, yes, you can probably have a shootout and somebody's gonna die, right? So let's say you're digging without staking at first, and then you need to go take a leak. Oh, 
okay? You, you, you go like, okay, I'm out of here. And the next person comes around and go like, yeah, I think that's dirt, that there's gold under this dirt too. So the other person will start digging your gold. So by that time you come back, you go like, hey, I don't remember that you know, hole being this big and this deep. And all that gold is gone already because the other person has just you know, taken your gold. You see what the problem is? Okay. So that's why we want to reserve the space first by using a minus minus SP. It is equivalent to putting your stake down and say, this is my spot. Now, once you have taken the spot, and we, uh, we're assuming everybody respect the law at the time, you can just go away, you can go to the bathroom, have your meal, come back and say, okay, I'm continuing to dig my own you know, dirt now. Because the other person, the other people can walk around and go like, oh, okay, this spot is reserved, I'm gonna reserve the next spot. They, they're not gonna dig your goat. Is that okay? So that's why we have the reserve first, and then we say, okay, then I'm gonna put something over there. Now the reverse operation is the same. Before you deallocate, you better retrieve all the gold first before you remove the stakes, right? It's, it doesn't make sense to remove your stake first and then, then you can do something else and then come back and say, oh, I wanna retrieve my gold. So you gotta retrieve the gold, make sure the stake is still in place. Once you're done with that steel spot, that little lot, then you can remove your stakes and go like, okay, I don't need this space anymore. Somebody else can continue to dig it if they want. Yep. So on a kernel level, if uh, you reserve your space, you get an interrupt, and something else tries to take your space, exactly. it will automatically jump yep. somewhere else. Yep. Wow, I didn't. So the interrupt thing is a difficult one to explain and also to visualize, because Linux is a protected mode operating system. Which basically means, you know, when interrupt happens, it doesn't use your stack. It uses the system stack, which is different, which is separated from your stack. So you don't really get to see, oh, my stack is getting corrupted, you know, because I used the stack pointer in the wrong way. You don't actually get to see that. The only time you get to see that sort of thing is when you program an Arduino, okay? Because an Arduino is based on the 18 mega, you know, processor line, which has no operating system, has no protected mode, you know, operating system whatsoever. So there's only one single stack for everything. The interrupts would use the same stack. Your code would use the same stack. So now, if you don't use the stack correctly, you will see corruption, which can be a big problem, okay? <clears throat> so this is something that is kind of important, but it's not easy to illustrate using the toy processor because we don't have the capacity of interrupts you know, just yet, okay? All right, so given this is what we need to do, um, and also given the stack pointer is kind of important, most architectures will allocate one single register or dedicate one register as the stack pointer. So that one single register usually would be system-wide respected as the stack pointer and not be used for anything else. So with our toy processor, we have a little problem because we only have four registers to begin with and we need a lot of registers for just about any operation. So I'm gonna to have to use one particular register as the stack register, or the stack pointer. Okay, so in the toy architecture, we will designate, which one do you want to designate as the stack pointer? B. Mm, B is kind of random. <laughs> How about register D? We'll just use register D as our stack pointer. Okay, we'll, we'll designate register D as our stack pointer. Okay, now this is kind of important because you cannot use register D for anything else now that it is designated as the stack pointer, okay? All right, so now that we have designated the register D as the stack pointer, let's see how we can do the call and how we can do the return, okay? So getting back to this code, I'm just gonna copy and paste it because this time we'll go ahead and add something to it. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so how do we call you know, function f? The first thing we need to do is to find out where I'm supposed to return to. So I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna cheat here and say, I'm gonna use a label to indicate the address of the return zero state. Okay. I mean, this is typically what the assembler would do anyway, okay, so the, the assembler has a way to figure out the return address, or in some cases, you know, it is just done by hardware, 
Okay, but I'm gonna do it like this. Now that I know where I'm supposed to return to, how do we save the return address on the stack? We know that the register D is designated as our stack pointer. So if I spell out all the operations, yep, go ahead. You would, um, so do you already have ret adder loaded into a register now? You have to load the address. Well, we have a few things to do. We have to adjust the stack pointer first, right? Because the first thing we need to do is to do with this, right? But SP is really D, so we have to do something like that. And then we can say that is return address which we cannot do because we have to use an intermediate register to do that. So we have to say A equals to return address and then star D equals A. So these three would save the return address and then we have to call, yeah, go ahead. Star D equals B. Star D equals A, sorry. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> so these three instructions is corresponding to the first item that we need to do which is to save the return address on the stack. Minus minus D, also decrement D is reserving the space on the stack. A equals return address, well, that's just using an intermediate register because there's no way I can store directly into uh, memory address. And then the third line is to actually save the return address on the stack now that I know where I'm supposed, where I'm supposed to save on the stack. Is that okay? So the, yeah, go ahead. No, it's the opposite because D is the stack corner. I want to store something in the stack, so I have to dereference the stack corner to specify the place that I need to store that something. That something that I need to store is the return address, which is currently stored in register A. Is that okay? So far, so far. Did say it again? I'm working on it. You're working on it. Okay. So that accomplishes number one. Number two is something that we can also do, but that's fairly easy to do, because you know we just have to say A equals to the address of the function, which is the label F, and then we say, let's jump over there, PC equals A, and that's the second part. So let me just kind of highlight which portion is which portion. This portion is one, okay, we'll call this one A, one B, and this is 1C, three steps to perform step one, and then this is step 2A, and this is step 2B. So basically these two lines correspond to the second step, these three lines correspond to the first step. So a single call using our toy processor would involve five instructions. Is that okay? <clears throat> And of course, we don't have a minus minus D, which is actually, we know it as D minus equal to one, but we, don't, we cannot do that either. So we have to say A equals one, and then do a subtraction. So make it six instructions. And we have to change all of these two, one A, one B, one C, one D, and then two A, two B. Are there any questions about how we call a subroutine and how we use a stack pointer in the process? Aren't you glad that you are usually writing code in C and C++ and Java and not using the toy processor <laughs> often? <laughs> what about the Intel architecture? What do you think the, you know, the Intel architecture has to do in order to call a subroutine like this? Well, it has to worry about passing variables and arguments and things like that, too, so it's not just... Yeah, we are not passing any arguments whatsoever. So just you're calling the subroutine. Yep. So the uh, the address isn't saved in the register? It's saved in memory? It is not. It's saved in memory. That is correct. The return address is in memory because it's on the stack. The stack is really just one portion of memory that you have you know, designated as quote unquote, this is the stack. Okay, we only use this part using the stack pointer. Any questions about this part? Now let me just uh, double check to make sure the recording is on. Yep, it is still on. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Yep. Where does uh, return address get evaluated? 
return address is a label, so the <laughs> assembler will figure it out. So the assembler will figure out, okay, where what is the address of this return or whatever opcode is corresponding to it, and then it will use that value to uh, put into A with that one single instruction. So I'm using the C notation instead of the LDI, ST instructions, but you can probably do the translation pretty easily, okay? <coughs> Sorry? On line 2A, what is F? 2A, F is the label of the subroutine. Because the entry point of the subroutine is designated by its own label. In this case, you know, the label is F. So A contains a return address, but then we overwrite A with F. That's right. But that's okay because A, whether this A is, is already stored on the stack, so I can reuse the register A for the second branch, the unconditional branch. Yep. And what happens if you're only going back one element in memory um, at a time? Like when we did the other, wait, actually, is that? Yeah, one's um, When we did the last recursion thing, there was like, it's like everything's going back three spaces instead of one. But that's because we also got other things to worry about. So right now, I'm not even worrying about local variables or parameters or anything like that. I'm only concerned about control, okay? How do we pass control to the subroutine? When the subroutine is done, how does it pass control back to the caller? Okay, and then, uh, well, like this next question is gonna be, like, how do you, what happens if you, like, go back too far? Like, if you go, to like, I don't know, say that you're like when you run out of stack space. Yeah, like like say that this was like I don't know five elements away from the end. Like but then we get a segmentation right? call. Last time. Well, with a toy processor, you don't get a segmentation fault. With a toy processor, unfortunately, it just rolls back. It will so uh, a z if you subtract zero, if you subtract one from zero, it becomes two fifty five again. Yeah. So we oh, will okay. have some really fun fun, uh, fun time you're corrupting the stack not knowing that we're corrupting the stack. So mm -hmm. let me get this right. Program yeah. counter equals A. That means we're jumping to the function F. Yes. And it's somewhere in F that reaches from address D mm -hmm. for the return address. And that's no, 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 no. It's not using register. Well, it's using register D to dereference to get to the return address. And that's, it'll do that in the function F. Correct. Right. Okay, now it makes sense. Yep. All right, so is that is that cool so far? Okay. So what we need to do, or what I'm going to do next, is just to use the mnemonic also, you know, because I think some of you are more used to the mnemonic than the C statement version of the opcode. Which one do you guys prefer? I mean, I can do either. Do mnemonic? OK, we'll do mnemonic here. So load A with 1, and then we do a subtraction A from D. And then this one is LDI A with return address. And then this one is ST storing into what D points to, the register A. Um, and then this one is just LDI again, LDI A with F, which is a label. And then this one is JMPA, because we are using register A to tell me where to continue execution. So here you, you have the complete version of, you know, well, save for the actual opcode, but you have the both the C notation on the left hand side and then the mnemonic version on the right hand side. Is that good so far? Okay. So what I'll do is I'm gonna <coughs> shrink this window a little bit, okay? Because I want to show you what the what function F itself has to do. Um, I cannot open up two windows of the same document, which means the only way to do this is to yeah, yeah. But I want to open it not as a new document. I want to open a new window. There we go. Okay, so new window, and then just copy and paste this code. Okay, there we go. Copy and paste. Okay, so this one, this way, I can show you um, the caller code on one side, and then show you the um, callee code on the other side, the subroutine code. Okay. So the subroutine has got two things to do. Retrieve the return address from the stack, number one, and continue execution at the ret retrieved address, which is number two, okay? 
So what do we do? Let's let's think about this, you know, in terms of stack operation first. Okay. So what we're really trying to do is something like this. We would love to do something like this if we could. Okay. That is actually what we want to do. Okay. SP being register D, obviously, okay, because register D is our designated stack pointer. So if I want to use you know, just a C notation, this is what we want to do. Note that this is not a pre increment, it's a post increment, which means we are using the value of D to do the dereference first, and then after the entire statement is done, then we increment the value to kind of point the stack pointer back up one location, okay? So this is what we want to do, but we can't do this. We, we don't have a single instruction to do something like this. So we have to break this up into multiple operations. The last thing we want to do is to do the plus plus D, okay? So we'll save this one for last. The first thing we want to do is to retrieve um, whatever content is on the stack pointed to by register D, but we can't put it into the PC right away because if we did, then we would have continued execution and not have a chance to adjust the stack pointer. Does that make any sense? So you copy whatever is D into A. So we have to copy that into A first, correct. So we say A equals to whatever D points to. And then after that, I have no use of the current location that D points to. So we, we need another register to do this. <sighs> yeah, we have to use another register. There's no, no easy way to avoid this one. B equals 1, then you B equals 1. And then you do. Yep. There we go. Yep, so we have to break it down. So this one single thing, which is representing how we actually want to do the return, is broken up into four individual instructions. And let me label these so the same way. So this is 1A, and this is, those are all number two. Nope, I take it back. This is 1B. This is 1C. Uh, well, retrieve, continue execution. This is still 1C, and this is the only part of step two. Because I'm counting the adjustment of the stack pointer as one, retrieve as part of the retrieve operation. Is that okay or not? This is the this is how we represent what we want to do in C and C++, in Java, in Visual Basic, and just about any programming language that I have encountered, save for Perl, okay, because Perl has very strange way of doing things. <clears throat> I like Perl. This is how we want this is what we actually want to do as far as the register D is concerned, as far as the program count is concerned, but we don't have a single instruction to do this. This is what we actually end up doing with the toy processor because of the restriction of what kind of instruction we are actually uh, implementing. Okay? So getting back to this one, let's look at the mnemonics of the, all of these things. So the first one is a LD, um, A from what D points to. The second one is LDI B with one. The third one is add uh, B to D. And then the last one is just a JMPA. So those are the four instructions for doing a simple return from a subroutine. It seems like it's easier to do the return than it is to do the call. Yes, it is. Because with the call, you actually have to specify where you're going to because that's, you have to use the address, the entry point of the address of the subroutine. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm so thankful we have C++ in Java. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because now, this is tedious. This is extremely tedious, okay? even compared to the assembly language of most architectures, okay? Because in the Intel architecture, okay, let's say you're dealing with the Intel x86, not x86, uh, well, they're all pretty much the same in, in this regard. In the Intel architecture, okay, so using the i386 or just about any Intel instruction, this is simply known as call f. <laughs> Are you serious? I am serious. One single instruction in the Intel architecture would do what is what our six instructions are doing? Are those the actual six um, instructions it calls when for us that? in the toy oh, process. For our purposes, yes. Yeah, for our purposes, we have to do these six opcodes, 
And then the Intel architecture, on the other hand, only has to do one. And then the return part is just as dramatic because you know, with the i386 or just about any ARM architecture, it is known as RUT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is not only illustrating the basic, the underlying operation of everything, it's also you know, contrasting the risk concept versus the CISC concept. Okay? Yeah. You have a CISC and they use a RISC? No, this is RISC. The toy oh. processor is basically the uh, the most, well, I wouldn't say the most pure form because there are actually more pure ways of doing conditional branch. So the way I do conditional branch is already not so pure. Okay, But this is it's pretty close, pretty darn close to the most pure form of RISC. This is RISC. This is CISC. Once again, we have RISC versus CISC. I prefer okay. CISC. Now, as a programmer, you would prefer CISC because but as a, as a teacher, as you engineer, probably. you probably prefer RISC. Well, okay, this is where you can do have trade-offs. Okay, in other words, you have to ask yourself how often do we call subroutines and how often do we return from subroutines. So, it, it, depending on the purpose of your architecture, okay, some architectures are not a general purpose architecture, so you don't do call and return too much. So but for a general purpose architecture, you do call and return a lot, right? So that means if you have a lot of code that looks like this, it makes sense to kind of implement it as one single opcode, okay? Even though it is not very pure, you can still do it with single one single opcode. Now, with our toy architecture, we have a lot of opcode space left, which means if you can afford to mess up register A, and well, with this one is only mess up, messing up register A, we can combine all of this into one single opcode. So that one single opcode would have basically six slices, or six individual uh, microcode slices in order to accomplish that one single instruction. But it will still be a fair trade-off because you know it is so used so often. Yep. Um, let's say that you've got something in register A being used by the rest of the program. Now, hear me out. If the compiler notices that, will it do something about that, or will it simply use another register if it's available? That's a good question. Let me uh, listen hear the other questions too because they may be related. Go ahead. I was just wondering what's easier to debug. Okay, what's well easier to debug as opposed to you know your question of uh, what if the compiler is realizing that you're using register A? So to address your question first, okay, the compiler doesn't because if you're using the compiler, the compiler has its own way of using the registers. So if it's not going to generate code or a correct compiler is not going to gener generate code that will overwrite a register that is currently in use, it can track what registers are currently in use, and if a register is currently in use but it needs it for something else, they will have to save that register into memory first, and then they can, they can use that register for something else. So if you program poorly and you overwrite register A because you've already used register A for something you need, then, then you have a problem. So well. Yep, then you have a problem. Okay. Now to address your question, okay, which one is easier to debug? Um, the risk way is definitely more prone to error, and, but this is also why you use macros. So you can basically define a macro and say that, okay, this one single macro expands to this. And so you can do that. But you can also, quote unquote, use the macro concept in the microcode and just implement a new instruction call, you know, call, okay, C-A-L-L. But then in the process of using the call instruction, you will have to overwrite register A, <coughs> which is kind of like a, side effect of that instruction, mm -hmm. okay? And the same thing applies to the return, but the return is gonna mess up two additional registers. So you have to be careful with the return instruction. If you are to implement return as one single instruction and combine the microcode of these four instructions into one single actual outcode, you can do that, but it will mess up two registers. This will mess up your register A as well as register B. Yep. For the sake of making sure you never overwrite your data, would it be prudent perhaps to store data from 
A, B, C, and D in a stack space and then recall it when you get back to the other function. But then, but then you have a circular problem because in order to save A in onto the stack, <laughs> I see. <laughs> so you have basically one scratch register that you have to say, okay, it's a, it's a toss away. There's no way to, uh, to save that one single register on the stack. Are there any other questions about you know, how we call and how we return before I kind of combine all of these into one single uh, subroutine or one single program? No questions? All right. So the next thing we're going to do is to continue with this thing here. Okay. So we're going to look at the actual assembly code corresponding to all of this stuff here. <clears throat> and just to make it a little bit more fun, okay, you know, I know you guys don't want it, but we'll say that, you know, we have a variable x here, and let's say x is an integer, um, and in main, I want to initialize x to 2, okay, so x equals 2, and the subroutine f is going to have a conditional thing so that um, it would do it if x is greater than 0, it would call itself, Otherwise, it will do the return, okay? So, just so that we have recursion, so that we can actually see this code works with recursion. Yep? There's no, there's oh, no, there's okay. No, uh, there's no recursion in the string. All right, fine. You guys, you got me. of that yeah thank you okay so this is recursive and it will supposed it's supposed to return so we'll go ahead and implement all this code in the actual toy processor code and then you know we probably will have to spill into uh, lab time to finish this program but the end result is we have we will have a program that uh, that can actually run and you can actually see you know the whole thing in action you know when we call what is involved when we're returning what is involved, and you can also see what is on the stack at any particular time. Okay? Any questions about you know, what we are about to do? Okay? So we'll deal with main first. Okay, so main is the entry point. Okay, we don't really need a label for main because you know that's the actual entry point of the entire thing. We assume this is location zero in our toy processor. X is a memory location, so in order to store a what was it, three? into x2, we'll have to do something like this, LDI, <coughs> uh, register A with the location of x, which is in memory, and then we have to do LDI B with the value that we want to put into x, and then we say STAB, because we are storing 2 into uh, the label or the address corresponding to label x, and then the rest of this program is just going to be exactly the same as what we had here. So we'll go ahead and just replicate that code. Low A to the 1, subtract the, oh, we also have to initialize the stack pointer. Now, the initialization of the stack pointer, when you're writing code in C and C++, you don't have to worry about it. Because when you run your program, the operating system, while it loads and initializes everything and get ready for your program to execute, the operating system is responsible to initialize your stack pointer. So you never really have to deal with the initialization of the stack pointer. The toy processor, unfortunately, cannot run Linux. Mm -hmm. Now, if you guys want to port mm -hmm. Linux to the toy, pro toy processor, be my guess. You might want to extend the byte-wide you know, thing to at least 16-bit or 32-bit. <laughs> <coughs> OK, so, so in this case, you know, we also have to initialize the stack pointer which is simply done by you know, LDID with a particular label. And it is conventional that, you, we, that we use um, the last spot of memory space as the stack corner, at least you know, in the older programs, that's how we do it. But instead of using 256, I'm going to use 0. Because remember, a register is only 8 bit wide. It cannot store a value of, two, of 256. So if I store a 0, the first time I do the decrement, it would decrement it to 255, which is the first usable byte for the stack. So this is how we initialize the stack pointer. Okay, so the rest is really just a copy of what we had um, 
up here. So I'm just copying all that code from up there. Return the address. And then the next one is STD A L D I A F and J M P A. That will do the, the whole call thing. And we don't really have a return zero with a toy processor. So by the time we get to the return address, the only thing we're going to do is a halt instruction to basically say, okay, stop everything, we are done. Okay, now we can specify the subroutine. The subroutine is F, okay? And F does you know, all of these new things here. So we'll go ahead and copy and paste this. Ah, undo. And we'll, I'll, put, I'll paste it over here, just because I, I already have most of the code over here. So F is going to be the entry point of the entire subroutine. The first thing it needs to do is to do a conditional statement to see if X is greater than zero or not. Okay? And to do that, we have to do a LDIA with zero. Um, well, okay, let's say LD, LDIA with X first, and then we retrieve the value of X into register B. And then we'll do the zero, LDIB with zero, and then we can now compare. Well, 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 now you just you with the uh, value of that. Yeah, so you just erase. So oh, you have okay. the LDIA zero. Oh, okay, right. Zero, A. There we go. So we are comparing, we are subtracting the second operand from B the first. B so we a, have yeah, a, a, a B. A a. But you have a conditional jump if, if they are zero? Like, like uh, well, 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 that's just taking Jay Z, wouldn't like Jay Z something? Jay Z would catch C equals to zero, not Z equals to one. So if they are equal to zero, well, Jay -Z would you jump. If, it's, if they are zero, then Jay Z would be one. Z probably one. Okay, so if let's, it, let's yeah, figure out what we need to do here. So the C code looks like this, okay? This is the C code that we want to implement, which means if X is less than or equal to zero, we are branching to the else branch. Does that make any sense? Okay. And what is the sign of X? Is it signed or unsigned? The way I declare X. Let's figure out right here. Oh, I did, oh, X is a global variable, it is a no, it is signed. It is signed. Unless it is unsigned, it is signed. Uh, as default, it's signed? Yeah, default is signed. Oh, I thought it was unsigned. Nope, nope, the default is signed. So x is a signed integer. Okay, so given it is a signed integer, and I want to skip to go return when it is less than or equal to zero, how do I specify the jumps? Well, you need to be able to jump if Zero. Now this is a very uh, special case, so it's actually fairly easy to do. So we will do a JZ first, okay? So if it is zero, we jump to where A points to. But the other one is either JL, you can use JL if you want to, but JS would do the same thing. Because anything <coughs> that is zero cannot overflow. And if you cannot overflow, then the sign flag and the L flag are the same. Okay, so in this very specific case, you can actually use JS, but in general, you should use JL for a signed comparison. So we have two ways to go to A. If we don't go to A, that means we have to subtract one from X. So once again, we do LDI. I can do a little bit of optimization here, you know, but I'm not doing that optimization. Well, B still has the value of A, so I can now just do that. I'm, I'm, I'll do a little bit of uh, optimization here and then we have to store that back into X so we have to LDI oops LDI A with X <clears throat> and then do ST A with B okay and then here comes the label go return but before I do this go return oh by the way this is one mistake that some people made in the exam is they forgot to branch around um, a condition, or you know, forgot about the fall through thing, because if I don't specify a jump around a go return, 
it's going to fall through to um, go return, which is actually just fine because it has to do a return here anyway. So the actual code is just return. So it's okay not to have the else case, which means you know, I don't have to jump around it. There we go. So go return is going to do exactly what we specified here, which is LD A with whatever D has, LD I B with one, um, add D B and J M P A. There we go. So that's our subroutine A, subroutine F, and also our main, which is our caller. Now the only one, one thing I have to be very careful about here, oh, I forgot one thing. I changed X, but then I forgot to call F recursively. <laughs> Which basically means I just need to do those five instructions here. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And also the label. I have to change the name of the label here. So that's the last thing that we do before we go return, which is here. And I cannot reuse a return address, so I'm going to put a return address one here. So that is the code corresponding to the C code of a simple subroutine that does not use any parameters or local variables and just return. But it is recursive. Okay. Why do you have to use return or red address one instead of red address? Because the other one is already used. I cannot okay. reuse the same label name. Yep, so I cannot, I cannot reuse the same label name. All right, are we okay so far with all this stuff here? Do you guys want me to kind of annotate uh, which part is which part? Mm -hmm. wow. The compare where is, means that where is B is less than A. One, or Sorry? Okay, go ahead. Where does return address one go? Return address? Return address one. Address one. Return address one yeah. is right here. No, where does it, where does it go? Here. Yeah, where's the location that's you're, not you're It's not the same as go return. It's, a, it's the same as go return because I have to continue execution over there. In the C code, this call is followed by this return at the end. So it so so that's why you know return address one actually is the same thing as go return. There's no difference between those two labels, but for but they serve different purposes. One is a label for skipping in a conditional statement, and the other one is to designate an address to return to from a call. So that's why I use two different labels, but they turn out to be exactly the same thing. Yep. So in this case, in this case only, if you were programming it for ease and efficiency, you could use the same label, although the It wouldn't change the runtime efficiency. It would just make the assembler run a little bit faster because it only has one label to deal exactly. with instead of two. But the code that it generates would still be the same. Oh. Okay. Yep. Yeah, All right. So are we okay or not? Shall I kind of redo this part here? You know, just use the C notation. If x is greater than zero, is here. And then the conditional branch is here, which means you know, this is the first part of the then of the conditional statement, <coughs> which is the first thing we need to do is um, x minus minus. And then the second thing we need to do, which is starting from here, is the recursive call of f itself. And this is the end of the then portion. And then this part, this last piece here, is really just a single return statement in C. Is that okay? Okay, all right. And I'll do the same thing with main, okay? So this part, you know, the label f is really just the entry point, so it's really just you know, saying that this is the beginning of the function f. And you know, if I want to designate a closed curly brace for the entire function, I would just probably, probably put it here. There we go. So now you can see the quote unquote C program on as comments. In this case, your know, main is starting here. Okay, so this is main. Um, this part here is just initializing x to 2. So x equals 2. And then the, this part here is the calling of the subroutine f. And the halt 
is kind of doing the same thing as a return zero, except we don't have a place to return to, so it's quote unquote return zero, and then that concludes the main subroutine. Will you be able to upload this to like Google Drive? Oh, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So we can take a look at it and redo it? Instead of just watching it through the uh, yeah. YouTube. I don't know how many of you, you know, live at home where your parents can kind of watch you when you do your homework or when you study. If, you're, if your parent asks you, you know, why are you watching YouTube? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can explain and go like, yes, everything is on YouTube with this class. Unless they're watching, unless they see me watching like a cat video, then I can't use that anymore. We can use cats in our example programs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see. Uh, shared. There we go. Shared. Should we put it under processor? I'm going to make a new folder. Uh, Subroutines. And in here, I'm going to create a new document. Or do you want the actual document that I wrote? I can either do that way, too. It doesn't matter. I think either way. Um, let's see. Because this one is not saved. I'm going to save this file and upload it. So save into the temp folder as subroutine.txt and go to the browser and upload it. There we go. So now you should be able to see it now. It's just a text document, you know, it, it will open it like this. And I can open it as a, as a Google document, so now it is also created as a Google document. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure, absolutely. So now I can switch to here for all further, you know, annotation, so this way I don't have to do it twice. And because it's not a fixed size font, we're gonna switch it to fixed size. So the indentation would look right. <laughs> All right, cool. So now we, we have to assemble the program because the objective is I want to be able to run this program, right? <clears throat> and go like, wow, that's gonna take a while. That is gonna take a while. Well, let's see if I can optimize that process a little bit. Copy, and then we'll open a Spreadsheet. The best way to do it is using a spreadsheet. Oh, yeah. Open sheet. And see if I can paste a document into a spreadsheet. Yes, I can. Okay. Excellent. Okay. And now we need to go back to here because I can never remember my own opcodes. <laughs> so I can go to, nope, shared processor. And it's instructions. There we go. Nope, not I3. Nope, 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 nope. Not, not I386. Opcode table. There we go. All right. So the way I'm going to do this is to locate all the LDI instructions first. So I'm going to do it in by by instruction. So it's a six C and then plus whatever the register is. Six C plus. Okay. So we let's go back to the other slide. And let me change the name of this. We name as recursion. Okay, this is the recursion subroutine. Okay, so this is going to be, I'll put it over here, uh, 6C plus D. So this is 6,3. C plus 3 is, that's a 6F, I think. 6F and then a 0. Uh, this is just a label main, so we'll put a label main here. <clears throat> it doesn't use up space, it's simply you know, a label definition. Um, this is LDIA, which is a 6C with X. Okay, so we'll resolve the X later on. This is LDIB, which is a 6D with a 2. Um, this is STA, we'll skip that one. Uh, 6 C with a one. So are we gonna do something like this on the final? 
No, you don't have to do the assembling. Okay. So I'll just make it very clear, you know, in the final exam, you know, if I require, if I want you to write any code, do not assemble, okay? You can just give me the mnemonic or the C equivalent form of the mnemonic, depending on which one you feel more comfortable with. 6C again with an F. <coughs> And this is a whole instruction, which is a one. And this is 6C again, and this is an X. Oh, we need to allocate X you know, at some point. So we'll put an X down here. And X is going to be um, a dot byte. We'll put a zero here, it doesn't really matter what it is. Can you do a C out with mnemonics in the toy processor? C out. Like display text to a screen? You can't, right? Well, somebody actually modified the toy processor to be able to do that. <laughs> you can use, a you, you can, uh, you can use the dumb terminal. Well, yeah. Uh, it it is very painful to do that. <laughs> but you're not going to do that on a file, though. To do what? C out? Yeah. No, there's, there won't be oh, any C right, out. No. <laughs> It'll be very interesting to uh, to see yeah, if anyone is to take this architecture and actually implement it, extend it to 32 bit wide, and actually make it work. Like, is it theoretically possible to recreate Intel's architecture in Logisim? Yes, you can. How long would that take? Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry? Is well, print the I386, of course. But like, he like print a system on a chip inside Logisim. Does that mean you'll have a dual core if you build it? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I meant more like what version. It's probably not that hard to make like a 286, but I don't exactly think you're going to get highlighted. Yeah, That's true. Yeah. Okay, this is going to be a 6D with a 1. That should be, that should be our project. Okay, there we go. So I got all the LDI instructions. The next one is going to be the ST instructions. So ST. Where's my ST? Right here. So it's an F and then XXYY. X is the right hand side. Okay. So this is a X. Okay, so X is B, so that's a zero, one, and B, zero, one, zero, zero. So that makes it a four. And this is a zero X, F, zero, zero, one, one. So there's a F3. Do you see how I'm doing it now? I mean, you know, instead of looking up the tables all the time, I'm, I'm just doing one type of instruction, one type of output at a time, so this way, my short-term memory can deal with it. So this is a 0, 1, 0, 0, which is an F4 again. And we should have, that's it. Yeah, so one more. Oh, there's one, another one, ST. Oh, there we go. So this is a 0, 0, 1, 1, so that makes it an F3. Now debugging this program is going to be fun too. Um, how do you know that it's F4 and F3? Uh, you mean this one? <coughs> yeah. Because uh, A is 0, 0, and then D is 1, 1. But X is actually the right-hand side, and then Y is the, uh, the one in parentheses. Oh, you're using 0. This is shorthand. Oh, I, did I? OK, so now we can focus on the jump A instructions. So go back to here, and unconditional branch is JMP. And that is a, it's a B and then uh, XX01. Okay, B, XX01. Okay, let's go for all the jump instructions now. Okay. Uh, B1, okay. And we look for the other JMP instruction. Okay, B1. And another B one. Okay, that's not too bad. 
Okay, so we have subtraction now. So let's look up subtraction. Subtraction is a 9 and then x, x, y, y. x, x is the one, x, x is the one that is changing. Okay, so this one is changing 1, 1. So it's a 9, um, 1, 1, 0, 0, which is a C. A compare is where's my compare? It's in the bottom. It's a one 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 zero is an E. So this is an E and it's zero one zero 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 one zero zero, which is a E four. A subtraction again, it is a zero X uh, nine. Does hexadecimal get easier the more you use it? Oh, yeah. yeah. You can see how I'm doing you know, all of this you know, kind of in my mind. I do make mistakes sometimes, so that's why an, an assembler would be good. <coughs> uh, this is 1100, zero, zero, which means it's a C. And we have an add here, and add is an 8. So it's a 1101, one, which is a D. Okay, so we have just the unconditional branches and the load instruction now. Okay, so the load instruction is a 7 in an XXYY, XX being the one being changed. So this is 110011, one, zero, zero, one, one, and what is the first one again? 7. Okay, so this is a 7 and then a 0011, zero, zero, one, one, which is a 7.3. I'll deal with those later. Okay, this is 0x7, and this is a 0, 1, 0, 0, which is a 4. And do we have another load instruction, LD? Nope, that's it. Okay, now we are down to the conditional branch instructions, and then we can calculate the addresses, and then fix up all the labels. <laughs> okay, JZA, JZ is this guy. <laughs> So A is easy because it's zero, 0, so we have a B3 here, B3, and then a JL is up here, JL is a 6, 6, 0 in this case, so 6, 0, all right. So I think we got all of the instructions done. So now we need to calculate the actual addresses. Do you guys remember how we did that last time? Calculating the addresses? <coughs> we used the, uh, the count thing. I, can, I cannot remember which count I used. I think this is what we what we did. Oh yeah, that would do it. So this will this will give me the number of instructions or number of bytes needed by each line. Oh, I forgot this one here. This is the last one, and there's a label called X, Oops. and the value is zero zero. And then we just need to calculate the actual address here. So the first one is always a zero. The next one and up is going to be whatever this one is plus the length or the width of that one. And just There we go. So we have all the instructions, all the locations, and we just need to resolve return address. So everywhere we see return address, we replace it with 16, which is hexadecimal one zero. And then go return. Okay, next one is F. F is 17. Sorry? Is it 
I don't understand. Okay, X is, well, because I have to, when I type in the program in RAM, I have to do everything in hexadecimal, so I might as well do all the conversions here. So a 4, 7 is a 2F, so all the X's are 2F's. I can probably use a search and replace to do this. And F itself is 1, 1. We are close. We are almost done. Return address 1 is 4.2. 4.2 two in hexadecimal is a 2A. Why is it a 2A? Come on, guys. Why is it a 2A? 42 in decimal is a 2A in hexadecimal. 32 plus 10. And 32 is 2 plus 2 times 16. So I think I got all the labels resolved. Yes, yes, yes. OK, so I'm going to save the file. Well, this is on Google Documents, which means it's automatically saved, which is great. So during the lab time, OK, I will, I'll give myself a six minute break. Um, during the lab time, I'm going to punch this in into the simulator in the RAM, and I will try to run it. <laughs> okay. Are we gonna like look at the RAM to see the number to see it? Are we gonna like look at the RAM to see the numbers changing it? Well, we'll see X changing, and we'll also see how the stack is being used to store the return address. So everything is going to be completely spelled out in this toy architecture, which is.